Hi, thanks for joining me today. I love new things. New things offer so much freshness, new opportunity, and new potential, and today is a new thing. Today is the very first session in what's going to be a 13-part series walking through the Old Testament prophetic book of Isaiah. Now, it's kind of odd. Isaiah may be one of the most well-known prophetic books in all of the Old Testament, partially because it's quoted so often uh, in the New Testament. Uh, but I, I feel like that this is going to be a real time of refreshment, a, a great time of encouragement and, and uh, learning over these 13 sessions that we spend together exploring this book of Isaiah. You know, it, it's a little different. Uh, th this book is often with the prophetic books, you began reading uh, and and understand a little bit about the personal life of the prophet, and certainly you learn and read about their call to ministry, their their prophetic call from God to do what it is that God has called them to do. This book is a little bit different. Uh, you do see a brief introduction in verse one, but then in verse two you immediately launch into Isaiah's condemnation of the people of God and how they have failed to keep uh, the, the commandments as given by God. It's not until chapter 6, really, that we come back to uh, Isaiah's calling and a further understanding of his calling. This is an abrupt beginning that we read in Isaiah. Now, Isaiah reminded the people uh, that one day they would be restored. And so just know, as we have this introductory, uh, these introductory comments, that Isaiah, man, he brings the heat, okay? Th th there were some serious issues that he had to deal with. But again, a little bit different uh, in this writing is that Isaiah also reminds the people that there's coming a day of restoration. There's coming a day that not only will they be restored in their relationship with Christ or with God, but there will be a day that the nation will be an absolute uh, signpost pointing to God for the entire world. And so that brings much hope uh, to the people of God. That brings much hope to a people that really is struggling uh, in their identity and struggling to find their way. In our passage today that, that we'll take a look at in just a minute, in, in this passage today, we see that frankly, the people don't have a clue. That They really have lost their way completely, and they have a complete lack of understanding about their relationship with God. For, for most of the people in the beginning of this book, the relationship they have with mighty God, with Jehovah, with Yahweh, is simply a vending machine mentality. In other words, they expect him to dispense blessing and favor upon them as a result of the offerings and sacrifices they make. The whole issue of relationship is left out. It's not present anywhere in their understanding. So let's get right into this. I hope you have your Bible. Uh, and as is so often the case, I want to encourage you, when this video is over, open your Bible to the first chapter of Isaiah and just read the whole first chapter, maybe even the first couple of chapters, because it will help you to begin to understand the context in these passages, these verses that we're looking at. So Isaiah chapter 1, let's read verses 10 and 11. Isaiah 1 verses 10 and 11. Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Give ear to the teaching of our God, you people of Gomorrah. What to me is the multitude of your sacrifices? Says the Lord, I've had enough of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of well-fed beasts. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or of lambs or of goats. Now, there's a couple of things we need to see immediately here. Uh, the first is, is authority. In verse 10, Isaiah says, Hear the word of the Lord. He, he's making it very clear. What you're about to hear is not my words. It's the word of God. And then the second thing that we need to understand is God was consistent 
God was consistent with his people. And he is reminding them that because of his consistency, he has a right to speak into them. He has a right of expectations. Now, as we read into verses 10 and 11, there is a reference made here, and it is never one that you want to have said about yourself. And that is the reference to Sodom and Gomorrah. You never want to be compared to these two evil cities. It's never a good thing because Sodom and Gomorrah is known and will always be known throughout history of places of extreme selfishness and self-centered, all about pleasing me. So selfish, so self-centered. And again, we're just taking the plunge right here in the very first chapter, the first verses of Isaiah chapter 1, and we've got Sodom and Gomorrah used as the comparison. That had to shock the system of God's people. God was really here saying, enough is enough. You know, God asked here in, in, in these passages, he says, what is it with your sacrifices? What are your sacrifices to me? So it's clear that they had continued to follow the Levitical commands of bringing sacrifices and bringing offerings to God. That wasn't the problem. But God is saying, what's the point? What is this to me that, that you would just go through the motions here? You see, the problem is the people lost sight of the purpose they lost sight of the purpose of the offerings, the purpose of the sacrifice. And that was a relationship with God. The God who had led them out of bondage. The God who had led them out of suffering. The God who had provided for them over and over and over. They were just turning this into just, just a, an exercise in futility. They were just going, marking off their checklist one by one, God goes on to say, I've had enough. I've had enough. I don't need your sacrifices. Let's look at verses 12 through 15. When you come, when you come to appear before me, who has required of you this trampling of my courts? Bring no more vain offerings. Incense is an abomination to me. New moon and Sabbath, and the calling of convocations, I cannot endure iniquity in solemn assembly. Your new moons and your appointed feast my soul hates. They have become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are full of blood. The issue that we see here. It is not practice. The issue is motivation. I wonder how often the same can be said of us. I wonder how often God says, why do they keep just going through the motions? It's relationship. It's their heart that I'm after. Motivation. What was the motivation of God's people? He even says in verse 13, he uses this phrase, useless offerings. All of their celebrations were useless because the people only did them for the blessing that they thought they would get. It, was a it wasn't a response of gratitude. It wasn't a response of worship. It was simply, if we do these things that God's commanded us to do, he'll be obligated to bless us. He'll be obligated to give us what we ask for. And God's saying that is not the case. In verse 15, it says, I refuse to look at you. God is actually saying he's turning away. In, in the Jewish tradition, to turn your face to someone means that uh, you're giving them your blessing, that they have your attention, that, that you are interested in them. And God is saying here in verse 15, I, ref I refuse to even look at you. Again, there's reference here and reflection here back to Sodom and Gomorrah with this reference of hands covered in blood. I mean, if it wasn't uh, enough the first time to reference them, here there's reference again, this, this hands covered in blood because of, of the evil done to one another. 
and for Sodom and Gomorrah. We see the same thing happening here with God's people. And this is absolutely key. Are you ready? Uh, you need to mark this down or, or commit this to memory. The Israelites didn't expect these things to matter to God as long as they made the appropriate sacrifices. They thought as long as they jumped through the hoops that God had given them, that everything would be fine. That wasn't the case. That wasn't the case at all. And God is showing them, God is telling them here in these passages, it matters. The condition of your heart matters. Let's look at verses 16 and 17. Wash yourselves. Make yourselves clean. Remove the evil of your deeds from before my eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Correct oppression. Bring justice to the fatherless. Plead the widow's cause. There really is uh, about five, four words here, especially in verse 16, that are absolutely key. And we need to remember these. You ready for these? Just very quickly. Wash, cleanse, remove, and stop. Wash, cleanse, remove, and stop. So we've understood already that God's people are just going through their motions, expecting God to bless them, expecting God to give. He says, no, I don't want your offerings. I don't want your, your celebrations. I don't want your convocations. This is what you need to do to correct the situation. And he says, wash. And he's really referring here more than a physical washing, a ritual washing. I want God saying, I want to know that you mean business. And I'm telling you, you need to wash. He says to cleanse, put away any sin uh, of impurity, any sign of impurity. You need you need to cleanse yourself, remove. He says, stop. That's the external part. Wash, cleanse. There's an internal understanding of this. This is this is a, a ritual that you need to do. I'm telling you to do because I want to know that your heart is serious about your relationship with me, God says. And then he says to remove, to stop. So that's the external part of this. There's some things you're doing. There's some things that you're not doing. You need to address those things. The same is said is, is true for us. If, if we are to have the relationship with God that he desires to have with us and that we claim as calling ourselves followers of Jesus, there is uh, a certain degree of ritual and understanding. Are we serious? How does God know that we are serious in our pursuit of him? And what is it on the external that we need to stop, that we need to stop doing in order to be all that he's called us to be. And then in verse 17, there's some positive commands then related to what we just read in verse 16. And here, again, there's five words. Those five words, learn, pursue, correct, defend, plead. He says, you need to learn. Let's go back and look in verse 17. It says, learn to do good. How do you do that? How do we learn to do good? That, that seems a little um, ambiguous. Learn to do good. Well, he tells you how you do that with the next four words. Pursue, correct, defend, and plead. It says, uh, we, all of these, uh, are, are from the law. When we re go back and read Exodus 22, verses 22 and 23, when we read uh, Deuteronomy chapter 16, verse 20, we, we get a real understanding of what it means to follow the law. And when we read those, it brings us back to those words, pursue, correct, defend, and plead, to pursue justice, to pursue justice in the world around us. Listen, that's kind of a hot topic uh, today in the world we live in, are you as a follower of Jesus? And out of that motivation only, are you pursuing justice in the world that where God has planted you? He says to correct, to correct oppression. Again, that's pretty clear. That, that is a pretty much a black and white statement. Correct oppression. Where do you see oppression? 
And are you doing your part, your role to correct that? It says to defend. Who, who is it that you're going to defend? Anyone who can't defend themselves. Anyone who needs defending, we're called to step in and defend them. It says to plead, to plead the widow's cause. That's part of what it means to be a follower uh, of Jesus. To plead for the widow's cause, the orphan's cause. It's one of the reasons, it's the primary reason that we choose to insert ourselves and be a part of an orphanage ministry on the other side of the planet. It's a, an area of great need. It's an opportunity that was presented to us, and many of you have stepped in to be a part of provision for orphans, as well as widows. We're active in, in ministering to widows here in our own community. All of those words, learn, pursue, correct, defend, and plead. Write those on a piece of paper. Stick them somewhere where you can see them. God's called the pe uh, his people then, through Isaiah, to turn back to him to restore the relationship with him. The same goes out to us. If we're to be seekers after his heart, followers heart after Jesus, these same things apply to us. Look at Isaiah verses 18, uh, 1, 18 through 20. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall become like wool. If you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be eaten by the sword, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Really, listen, it comes down. We have two, you and I, we have two choices to make when we are confronted by God's word. Are you ready? The first choice is to repent. To repent. Every time we are confronted with the truth of God's word, our first choice is repent. The second one, it says, is to refuse and rebel. That's it. That's your only two choices. That's my only two choices. Anytime we're confronted with God, the truth of God's word, just as Isaiah confronted the people of his day with the truth of God's word, they had two choices, to repent or to refuse and rebel. What's your choice today? This is going to be a fantastic walk through this book over these next multiple sessions, multiple weeks. There's going to be some hard truth that we're going to have to talk through. That's okay. Let's do that together. Repent or refuse and rebel. I'm seeking God for his strength to repent and seek the restoration on a daily basis my relationship with him, and that's my prayer for you as well. Listen, if you're in the Seymour South Knoxville area, you're looking for a place to engage, a place to belong, a place to learn, a place to serve, we would love for you to come and be a part of what God's doing at Valley Grove Baptist Church. We are right in the uh, on the Tri-County area, Blunt, Sevier, and Knox counties, and uh, easy to find right off of Chapman Highway. Uh, you'll see the address there. Also, maybe you've got a, a comment that you want to leave or a question. We're going to put a number up. You can text us that number, or you could even call, but you can also call us at the church office. Uh, that number is listed for you as well. We would love to hear from you. Email me. I'd be honored for you to email me and let's talk through some of the things that we have uh, examined today. Regardless, it's going to be a, a fun opportunity, a great opportunity for us to study and spend some time in God's Word. Don't miss it. Last thing I'll ask before we go, would you share this video? Share this video with someone in your sphere of influence, somebody that you've been praying for, somebody that, that could also needs to hear this word today. You can do that, obviously, through uh, the Facebook platform. You can do that through uh, YouTube, and it will be a great gift for you to give to someone, not because of anything I've said, but because it is God's word that we're reading. So thanks again for being with us. You be looking uh, for the next session as it becomes available. Uh, and until next time, I can't wait to see you again really, really soon. Have a great day.